Hello, and welcome to the Cooper Hewitt uh, Smithsonian Design Museum and to our Zoom webinar, a dictionary, of, a dictionary of Ornament Highlights from the Cooper Hewitt's Print Collection, which will be given by Rachel Jacobs. My name is Jamie Kwan, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Drawings, Prints, and Graphic Design. Our department is home to over 140,000 amazing objects, so I am so excited to share some of them today, specifically works from the DeClue collection. Uh, and before we begin, I want to remind everyone that there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please drop your questions into the chat. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Rachel Jacobs. Uh, Rachel Jacobs is an independent curator specializing in French 17th and 18th century books and prints, and she is based in Toronto, Canada. Since 2021, she is the remote senior research cataloger for the DeClue collection of ornament and architecture prints in the Department of Drawings, Prints, and Graphic Design at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. She was previously curator of books and manuscripts at Waddesdon Manor, Rothschild's collections, National Trust in England, where she continues to work remotely part-time. She has curated several exhibitions at Waddesdon Manor, including Alice's Wonderlands, Life, Collections, and Legacy of Alice de Rothschild, Glorious Years, French Calendars from Louis XIV to the Revolution, Royal Spectacle, 18th Century Court, Ceremony in Books, Prints, and Drawings, Kate Malone, Inspired by Waddesdon, and Playing, Learning, Flirting, Printed Board Games from 18th Century France. So thank you, Rachel, for joining us today, and please take it away. Thank you so much, Jamie. Let me just share my screen now. Bear with me. Okay, so thank you all so much for taking the time today to join us in looking at and discussing this wonderful collection of prints. Thank you, Jamie, for the lovely introduction and to all the colleagues involved in organizing this session. Um, for the past few years, I've had the great pleasure and privilege of diving into this collection of prints and cataloging them remotely for the most part on the internal database um, to help in making them more accessible to a wider public. Initially working with Julia Simon, who was at the time assistant curator in the department, and Caitlin Condell, I was then joined by another cataloger for a period, Elizabeth Sari Brown, who's now assistant professor of art history at the University of Georgia. We are, of course, not the first to catalog this collection, and we're very grateful to all those who came before. But as we know, in the museum world, cataloging is always an evolving process based on new goals, outputs, and of course, new research. Um, let me change slides. Cataloging Project was launched in 2021 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the acquisition of the Léon de Clou collection of ornament and architecture prints, which was intended as a library of decorative arts. This is the premier collection of ornament prints in the United States, consisting of over 430 bound albums and books containing some 13,000 European prints from the 16th through to the 19th century with a particular strength in 18th century French works. The project has led to the digitization of most of the collection and the cataloging of over 6,000 prints so far, which are now available online, alongside several public programs, including online talks and in-person session and blog posts. Here's a lovely image of the De Clue collection at the Cooper Union being used as it was intended for educational purposes. And you can see some albums there on display being sketched by some of the students. Ornament, so what is an ornament print? Ornament or ornamental prints were produced in Europe from the mid 15th to the 19th century with the general purpose of illustrating designs, patterns, or motifs of decorative ornament for use by craftsmen and applicable to all aspects of applied arts, from ceramic vases to pieces of furniture and from wall paneling to wrought iron gates. 
They were usually published in small sets of four, six, 10, or 12 prints, sometimes referred to as pattern books. They appealed to and were often marketed to both print collectors and artists or artisans alike, depending on the quality and finish of the designs and the engravings. Ornament prints were both useful artistic models and works of art in and of themselves. These prints were produced by several artists and craftsmen, including the initial designers whose creations are then interpreted and engraved onto the metal plates, sometimes by themselves or by printmakers, which are in turn printed and published by the print sellers and publishers. In some cases, the prints were published by the designers themselves in a way to promote their work to potential clients or towards the end of their careers, possibly as an income stream when their own capacity as production were starting to wane. The De Clue collection represents one of the most important of its kind. The prints teach us firsthand about changes in style, approaches to design, evolving technologies of production, the activities of the art market, and networks of patrons, artists, designers, architects, printmakers, and publishers. The category of the ornament print, as I've just described, is very broad. Its scope and definition are a modern invention, and one that has been particularly born out of 19th century public institutions, such as museum, museums when forming their print collections. Anthony Griffiths describes the evolution of this category as misleading because it lumps together a whole range of prints whose original intention may never have been shared, and thus implying a uniformity of initial purpose or buyer. As we will begin looking at some of these prints, I hope that you will see just how elusive some of them can be in terms of definition and even description. With forms and motifs morphing and transforming on the page, evading language with their twists and turns, as we, the humble catalogers, try to describe and interpret what we see. A problem that was beautifully summed up by Mr. Evans Jr., who's former curator of the Department of Prints at the Met in New York, in his article from March 1920 titled uh, Ornament. And in part defense of my work so far, uh, cataloging the collection, I wanted to cite uh, Evans directly. Ornament of this type is notoriously one of the most difficult things in the world to describe, since any attempt to do so properly and competently would require, as a condition precedent, the creation of a large and highly artificial technical vocabulary. He goes on, once it were worked out, would demand so much special knowledge that but the very smallest number of professional catalogers would be tempted to acquire it. But nevertheless, it may not be out of place with the aid of some reproductions to try one's hand at casting a little side light on some of the aspects of the material. And today I would like to cast a little side light of my own on the words and language used on the prints themselves. And hopefully this approach can provide a good introduction to understanding some of this material. How do these prints, how do these printmakers and publishers describe and title their works? What are the most common terms and motifs found within this broad genre? And finally, how do these two-dimensional prints translate to three-dimensional objects and interiors? Firstly, I wanna situate this language in a time and place. We will be looking for the most part at prints produced in Paris during the 18th century. At this time, Paris was the epicenter of the European print and luxury trade markets. In the late 17th and early 18th century, the reign of King Louis XIV established royal artistic and scientific academies and manufactories, attracting the best foreign artists and artisans, as well as producing and nurturing the next generations of French makers, leading to the dominance of French art and design within Europe. This luxury market was also made possible through France's access to quality natural materials from abroad through extensive colonies and trade routes. Due to the French nature of this material, a look at the language of ornament will not only require the translation from French to English, but will also require an exercise in historical translations as meanings, especially art historical terms change over time. Any translation is of course a form of interpretation. The most common configuration of the ornament prints in this collection were published, as I mentioned, in small series of four, six, 10 or 12 prints sometimes including a helpful and decorative title page. 
These small series were often named in French suites, series, cahiers, or livres. Uh, cahier, livre, both can be translated to books, but the word cahier can also be a notebook or a collection of sheets, which are not necessarily uniform or complete. And here we have three title pages where you see third suite of arabesques invented uh, by François Boucher, Jules François Boucher. In the, in the middle, you have Nouveau Livre, new book of cartouches for the usage of different artists. And then to the right, you have the second cahier, second notebook, second book of vases, um, implying that there's a series. Both, um, to note, the word suite had been associated, suite series, had been associated with Prince um, quite early on in the uh, definition in the French uh, dictionary, Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française, both in 1694 and 1798. The definitions include uh, references to Prince, series of Prince. Title page ornaments were also sometimes named recueil or collection. There, were, there was often a hierarchical, hierarchical meaning to the titles in that if it was a standalone series of prints, it might just be called a suite or a leaf or a book or a series. But if a number of series by the same designer were being marketed and sold as a group, they could be subdivided into cahiers uh, or leaf books within a larger recueil or oeuvre of translating to the works of an artist. And here we have on the left, recueil, a collection of vases composed and engraved by Personnet and underneath first suite. So we see that there's multiple suites within this recueil. And then on the right, you have the works, the oeuvre containing a recueil, a collection of trophies, attributes, cartouches, vases, flowers, and ornaments uh, by Pierre Ranson. The highly influential collector, printmaker, and print publisher, Gabriel Huquier, who we will encounter many times throughout this presentation, published the oeuvres of Messonnier and Oppenor, um, two of the most influential designers of the Rococo decorative style. This approach to gathering together all of the designs, or almost all of the designs, by a single maker and selling them as a whole collection or oeuvre was novel and did much to solidify the legacy of the Rococo style and its influence in France and abroad. And here I have just the title page for the oeuvre of Oppenor, which was bound together with a beautiful portrait of the architect there on the right. Sorry, move, move, I went a little bit too quickly. The most common word used by publishers to describe their sweet series or books or recueil collections of prints was new, always emphasizing the novelty and innovation, a marketing, a marketing technique which hoped to attract the eye of potential buyers. Another major selling point, which we've seen in the previous slide, was at times overemphasized was the usefulness of the designs. We see the words usage and utile, usefulness and utility most often for makers of all kinds of wares or students, sometimes uh, describing specific trades uh, for which these designs would be particularly interesting. Now I wanted to focus on a few of the most common ornamental motifs and words found on the title pages within the collection, cartouches, trophies, and vases. So a cartouche, as described in the Grove Dictionary of Art, is an ornamental tablet or shield bearing an inscription, monogram, or heraldic arms framed in elaborate scrolls, shell-shaped volutes, or similar devices. It adorned walls, facades, and furniture. It was also an important motif within manuscripts, books, prints, and maps, used as a framing device to enclose the titles, as we've already seen in a few of the title pages in the previous slides. The scroll or tablet nature of this cartouche as a perfect space ready for an inscription can be seen in the designs found within this book of cartouche, newly invented and engraved by Jean Dolivard, Juan Dolivard, and published in Paris by his aunt Marguerite Gastelier, wife of the prolific printmaker Jean Le Potre, who we will encounter once again later. Here we find cartouches for every purpose, heavy with allegorical motifs, ornament featuring war, death, 
classical Greek and Roman mythology, musical trophies, and of course the French king Louis XIV with the royal coat of arms and head of Apollo, his royal em an emblem used by the king um, as the sun king. This series was published in the late 17th century and showcases the heavier classical ornamental motifs associated with the French Baroque. In this new book of cartouches, invented and engraved by the painter and architect Alexis Nicolas Perignon, the Elder, published by Longchamp in 1759, we find beautiful architectural cartouches, arranged as one might find in an architect's sketchbook, a collage of source material and inspiration. Perignon traveled to Italy and Switzerland, and some of these newly invented designs may have, in fact, been inspired by these travels. The cartouches here are incorporated into architectural details, pediments, cornices, plinths, and funerary mon monuments. I just want to make a note that when I'm describing the titles of the work of the series and the prints, I am doing the translations, but the original French, as you can see, is um, in the captions. So in this series of 10 plates, after designs by Lange, active around 1730 and 50, produced by Jean Nicolas Jean Baptiste de Poilly in Paris. The cartouche is free from any form or medium. Instead, we find pure design, ready to be interpreted and applied by artists or artisans to all sorts of materials, a varying scale and purpose. One could imagine these typically Rococo asymmetrical, curvy linear cartouches formed of natural motifs everywhere on pieces of furniture, gilt bronzes, which we'll see a bit later and so on. The cartouche here becomes a purely ornamental form rather than functioning truly as a framing device. I mentioned Rococo as, we, so I'll just do a little description for those of you that are less familiar. Rococo dominated as the artistic style for most of the 18th century, known at the time as the style rocaille or modern style, style moderne ou goût nouveau, nouveau taste, new taste. The style developed during the 18th century incorporated asymmetrical forms combining both fantastical and naturalistic motifs. The label of Rococo, which I'll use again, was only invented after the French Revolution and was commonly used from the 1830s onwards. It was associated with frivolity and excess and often has negative connotations. Um, for more, uh, the Cooper Hewitt did a beautiful exhibition of Rococo continuing the curve in 2008 with an incredible catalog. So I, I urge you to have a look if you want more Rococo. This newfound freedom of the cartouche can also be seen in this beautiful series, Book of Ornaments, composed and published by the royal silversmith Pierre Germain and engraved by Jacques Jean Pasquier, 1751. Here, the title is also elegantly framed by a rocaille cartouche made of scrolling acanthus leaves and a shell. The cartouche design to the right incorporates military emblems, combining the visual language of the trophy and the cartouche, transforming it into an allegorical ornamental motif rather than a sort of strictly framing device. This is also a rare example of the price of the series printed onto the title page at two livres. You can see there just before Paris, two livres, 1751. This has been, this may have been more likely done because it was published by the designer himself. Um, so maybe he wanted to fix the price and not wanting possible print sellers to undersell or undercut his potential profits, not sure. In this series titled New Chinese Cartouches, uh, published and engraved by Gabriel Uquier between 1738 and 49, after designs by the artist designer Alexis Perrot, we see the cartouche stretched to its functional limits, whereby instead we have vignettes featuring figures in the fashionable Chinese inspired costumes within fantastical garden landscapes with a central oval asymmetrical cartouche made up of scrolling acanthus leaves, cartouches, flowers, architectural elements fantastical creatures and rock work. There's a whimsical play here with scale and proportion between the figures and um, its landscape. 
The series was dedicated to Gaspard Moise Augustin de Fontaineau, who at the time held the position of Controller General of the Garde Meubles, uh, responsible for the order and upkeep of all of the furniture and movable objects in the royal palaces, a sort of good dedication to have for Perrot, Perrot, who we know also designed furniture for the King Louis XV. So trying to uh, make those connections there and ple uh, please a future patron. Before moving on from cartouches, I wanted to look at this fascinating series, which incorporates the genres of ornament and fashion plates within an elegant aristocratic garden. The cartouche designs form impossible garden architecture. In this plate, we see a fantastical fountain topped with an elegant vase teetering within a cartouche, uh, while a young man sort of looks longingly at uh, a woman from across the fountain. Um, the series was designed by François Thomas Mondon and engraved and published by Antoine Avelin. We know that both jointly submitted a privilege application in 1736, the year of these prints, to protect their designs from being copied. The agreement between the two was such that Mondon, the artist that supplied the designs, and Aveline would then give him in return 150 impressions, along with reimbursement of any costs Mondon had made during the production process. I wanted to end this section focusing on cartouches by looking at the stunning side table made with Japanese black lacquer panels and gilt bronze mounts from around 1755 to 60 by Bernard van Riesenberg from the Reitzman collection at the Met. Here, we, the cartouches run wild, sculpted in the form of the gilt bronze mounts, framing the precious imported Japanese lacquered panels. Rokai at its best, with natural forms swirling harmoniously in every direction, forming cartouches within cartouches. And even the feet we can see are protected by little gilt bronze cartouches. Now we move on to another of the most common ornamental motifs we find, the trophy. The trophy has its origin in ancient Greek and Roman military victories. The Greeks hung their arms of the defeated of their defeated, hung the arms of their defeated, and the Romans created sculptures of these hanging arms to commemorate military victories. During the Renaissance, trophies and hanging arms and armor were used as ornamental motifs to decorate buildings. And 17th century classicism saw the popularity of this motif spread, expanding to include other themes such as hunting. And we also start to see trophies appearing more generally on different forms within the decorative arts. By the 18th century, we will see in the following slides, the themes expand by incorporating different attributes and allegorical objects associated with the with love, the art, science, and religion, all sorts of themes. So we begin with the military theme, the original theme, with this series titled Trophies of Arms, Antique and Modern, Useful to All Kinds of Artisans for the Embellishment of Their Works, newly designed and engraved by the prolific Jean Le Bautre, published by Pierre de Mariette in Paris between 1657 and 1682. Although Jean Le trained as a woodworker, he was not himself a practicing craftsman, but instead worked as a designer etcher directly for the print trade. He created thousands of designs for ornament, friezes, vases, interiors, often animated with figures and narrative scenes from the Bible, from classical mythology. His designs, although um, not sort of real or applicable in the in, in the three-dimensional world, really capture the spirit of, of the aesthetic of this period. I wanted to pair these, these heavy, wonderful uh, trophies with a detail from a Savonnerie carpet uh, at Wadsden Manor, which was produced in 1683 as one of the 93 carpets commissioned by Louis XIV for the Long Gallery at the Louvre. You can see a very similar trophy there. The example of the traditional hanging military trophy 
uh, this example uh, by the painter Jacques or Jean Dumont called Le Romain is from a series titled Book of New Trophies invented by Dumont, engraved by Jacques Francois Blondel and published once again by Gabriel Huquier sometime between 1729 and 61. The beautiful title page includes a cartouche or frame designed by Oppenau, who we saw earlier, whose oeuvre was also published by Huquier. The arms to the right feature imaginary foreign armor with a shield in the shape of a tortoise shell and feathered headpiece. And so from Trophies of War, we move on to the adjacent theme of hunting with this series titled Hunting Trophies by Jean-Baptiste Guélard after designs by the decorative painter Christophe Huet, who specialized in animals and monkeys in particular. Um, and you can see here a monkey acting like a human uh, in this uh, genre of singerie, we see the monkey on the title page holding a hunting trophy and poking at a dead rabbit or hare um, and bird. The, date, the series dates from 1741 and was published by Jacques Chirot. So from the inventive, here's a series reproducing a set of real panels that featured trophies and biblical scenes, which were designed and carved by François Rumi, made for the choir of the Parisian church of the Noviciat des Jacobins in 1723 to 25, the present church of Saint Thomas d'Aquin. The series records this commission with a set of beautifully engraved engravings published by Jean-François Dumont um, sometime later, around 1740 and 48. Rumi also worked for the Bâtiment de Roi and during this period, uh, during the 1720s, worked on most of the carved interior decoration at the Château of Versailles. To the right is the Louis XV, is an image of the Louis XV gallery at the Met with paneling featuring trophies, um, similar to ones we've seen previously, which have been more recently associated, attributed to the work of Rumi. In this series titled New Book of Different Trophies, invented by Antoine Watteau, engraved once again by Uki and published by Uki and Marguerite Caillou Chirou around 1735, we find a series of 12 ornamental trophies after the painter Antoine Watteau. Watteau is most celebrated for his paintings in the fête galante genre, featuring elegantly dressed aristocrats, can comédie l'art figures within grand garden landscapes, enjoying each other's company and flirtatious conversation. Although er earlier in his career, Watteau also worked and collaborated with uh, designers working within the decorative arts, such as Claude Gillot and Claude Audrin, producing and collaborating for costume and set designs, and panel designs for interiors. Here in this series, the objects and attributes included in the trophies seem to be plucked directly from uh, Vato's paintings. And I just wanted to, as a, as a little uh, visual delight, to show this uh, wonderful example of a painting by Vato called Fed Venetienne from 1718 to 1719, uh, currently in the Scottish National Gallery, which shows an example of uh, this musette or a small bagpipe, which we saw in the trophy. Um, and here apparently reworked the painting, he reworked the painting to include himself um, as a self-portrait as the musician playing the musette. A lovely connection with the trophy. These two examples of trophy designs representing the arts illustrate just how far the motif can be stretched. To the left, Apudo inscribes the words painting and sculpture onto a framed canvas or panel surrounded by objects representing the attributes of the arts with an inscription below stating painters always with a pencil in hand. And to the right, a beautifully delicate hanging trophy featuring an oval roundel with a woman holding a portrait surrounded by sculpted busts and a frieze. Surely an allegory to sculpture engraved by Marie-Thérèse Martinet after designs by François-Marie Isidore Quiverdeau and dated 1767. Both allegorical trophies stretch the motif beyond the strictly ornamental, um, incorporating figures, architectural features, and hints of a landscape, situating them within a space and time. And as is tradition now, I wanted to end by looking at trophies in the wild with a rather spectacular 
combined full front desk cabinet clock from around 1774 by René Dubois and Jean Goyer, again at Wadsden Manor. This enormous and puzzling desk features trophies everywhere on its side panels uh, and framed with a medallion on its front. And you can also spot a cartouche or two and a vase um, below. And to the left, I just wanted to show that the doors within the room that this desk is situated, the morning room, also have wonderful trophies, panels of trophies that date from about 1725, 17, 1720s, 1730s. So as I mentioned the vase below, this is the final motif that I wanted to look at and arguably possibly the most important. The vase has long been a successful ornamental motif for it is a multi-layered, for it is multi-layered, existing as a useful three-dimensional object with multiple purposes, as an artistic sculptural form, and as a canvas onto which ornament and narrative scenes can be applied. Here, form, function, and applied ornament can find perfect harmony and the possibilities seem endless, especially for those vases that only exist in printed form, as we will soon see. These, uh, was, this was a, not only a place of invention, but it also represented a noble object from Greek and Roman antiquity, a continuum of civilization as the early modern Europeans tried to associate themselves and their time with the glory perceived glory of antiquity. The vase designs we will be looking at illustrate the changing artistic trends once again from the late 17th century through to the late 18th century, the muscular Baroque classicism to the natural forms of the Rococo, and again back towards neoclassicism uh, from around the middle of the 18th century onwards. If you're a particular fan of the vase and neoclassicism, highly recommend the wonderful catalog Vase Mania um, from the exhibition that was at the Met, edited by Stephanie Walker. So here we have the title plate from the fourth book of vases by the French sculptor Aubert Henri Joseph Parent, published by Mondaire et Jean from around 1789 to 92, which includes an informative inscription below, which describes what we see as depicted. In the center, we see a large vase from what is described as a gallery in Florence, placed on top of an antique marble altar from the Museum of the Vatican, drawn by the artist while he visited Rome in 1789. Travel to Italy was an important part of an artist's education when possible, and we know that Parent traveled to Italy and after the French Revolution also lived in Berlin, St. Petersburg, and Switzerland. This series is a useful tool for artists and amateurs who may not have had the chance to visit Italy to see the ruins and objects from antiquity firsthand. Both the recording of what Parent saw and the creation of imagined compositions by combining objects and ruins from different locations. I couldn't help but myself but also show this wonderful example of Parent's work as a sculptor with this exquisite floral still life and vase relief carved in lime wood now at the Met to the right. And here's another example of a series of prints dedicated to the reproduction of existing vases. Um, but instead of looking at antiquity and Italy for, it, for its models, we, will, we find the marble, bronze, and lead vases from the royal gardens of Versailles, Trianon, Mar and Marley, engraved by Marie-Michel Blondel and published by her husband, Jean-Francois Blondel, around 1744 to 56. And the plate, um, so I've shown it alongside the actual vase that it's uh, so beautifully illustrating, which is still in the gardens at Versailles by the sculptor Jacques Herpin from 1694 and 85. Um, so, sorry, 1694 to, to 95. And um, this was this series was worked on also by uh, my colleague, my former colleague, Elizabeth Sari Brown, and she's uh, written about it as well. So please have a look if you're interested for more. Moving along to the early 18th century, we find some of these motifs, but done in a more playful manner um, by the designer and sculptor, Jean-Bernard Thoreau, called Thoreau, 
In the collection, we have many more designs by this artist for cartouches, trophies, furniture, and various ornaments. And I would love to just show them all to you because they're wonderful, but there's no time. Here, the ornament seems to come to life with the putti and festoons hanging from the vases and the masks, expressive faces about to speak out to us. The title page on the left is the clever tease of what we'll find within. The vase is on an ornamental plinth, but we can barely see it as the flying puto only begins to lift the curtain, enticing us to turn the page and discover the individual designs within this new book of vases. Moving on. This wonderful series of vase designs, once again, by Gabriel Uki after the designs by Ed, the sculptor Edmond Bouchardon was first published in 1737. The inventive designs combine natural forms with the classical rigor, structure and rigor, creating a sort of dynamic tension. The vase to the right incorporates the lower half, a basket weave, a material associated with sort of pastoral scenes of the Rococo, along with an upper section carved with diagonal fluting and a ram's head motifs more associated with classicism. Bouchardon won the coveted Prix de Rome in 1722, which allowed him to study in Italy, where he ended up staying for, ten year, for about 10 years. This series was published only a few years after his return to Paris when he was appointed sculptor to the king. Another example of this whimsical mixture of the natural world and classical formalism can be found in these designs for the fantastical and nonsensical um, vases engraved by Benigno Bossi after designs by Edmond Alexandre Pizzito. Here the forms themselves are grounded and seem plausible, but the ornament applied like these naked women balancing on an elephant's head on elephant heads are alive and moving. I wanted to also include the plate from another series, which is not strictly a vase, uh, but from the series of Masquerade in the Greek style, which is uh, costumes, these sort of fantastical costumes. And this design is for the, the bride in the Greek style. And he's it still has turned her into a vase. So a lovely allusion to Cicero's metaphor of the human figure as a vase. The body is like a vase, the vessel, the soul, of course. Thus far, we've encountered all kinds of artists, sculptors, goldsmiths, designers, painters, responsible for reproducing their designs onto paper. And now we come across a series of vase designs by Maurice Jacques, who was a painter and designer of patterns at the tapestry workshops of the Manufacture des Gobelins, which was established in Paris in 1662 to produce furnishings for the royal household. The designs are bursting with beautiful flowers, garlands and festoons in much the same way as the tapestry panel designs are uh, for which Maurice Jacques contributed. And here we see to the right around 1775, a lovely panel uh, by the Gobelin Manufactory where Maurice Jacques designs the, uh, the, the framing devices with this beautiful and similar vase uh, bursting with flowers uh, along the bottom. The vase design in the center uh, the lower section of the body of the design has a textile-like quality to it with its shading of dark lines, reminiscent of weaving, the weaving of the pattern textiles known as damas. You can also see this play between light and dark, between the satin weaves and the plain woven ground in reverse in the tapestry to the right. So it's just quite um, nice detail of the sort of textile onto the vase potentially, or illusion of textile. Next, we come to two series of vase designs titled First and Second Suites of Vases by Duplessis Fils, published by Duplessis himself around 1775 to 80. Jean-Claude Thomas Duplessis was the son of the Italian-born sculptor and designer, also Jean-Claude uh, Chamblet Duplessis, who worked for the Vincennes and later Sèvres porcelain manufacturers between 1743 and 1773, and was responsible for some of the most daring Rococo shapes of the period. Duplessis' son helped his father working alongside him as early as 1752. His, his father had passed away in 1774, a year before he started producing these series of prints. 
um, he may have been trying to forge his own reputation through the publication of these designs. Um, and you see here, I just wanted to give you an example of some of the Sev vases associated with Duplessis father and the vase and cover on the uh, produce at the Sev manufactory, the vase and cover on the left does look quite similar to the title page, uh, the form on the title page that we saw previously. Uh, and here again, the vase left at the Wallace collection and the to the middle, the ship vase, which again is from Wadsden, one of three at Wadsden and the wonderful elephant vase, um, uh, which we can see um, slightly more a realistic approach to the elephant than the Pizzito uh, engravings we saw earlier. And finally, the last series of vase designs we'll be looking at today are titled New Book of Vases composed by Voisin, son, again, turning master to the king, Louis XVI, designed by François Voisin and published by Louis-Joseph Mondaire in 1786 to 89. François Voisin was the son of Michel Voisin, who had previously also been turning master to the king, Louis XVI, before his death in 1786. This series of designs may once again be the case of an artisan showcasing his own skill and independence after the death of his father, master as we've seen with the Duplessis uh, prints earlier. Ivory turning was very fashionable at the French court. We know that the kings Louis XV and Louis XVI both took lessons at the lathe um, from their turning masters and most likely produced some pieces under their instruction. Here, um, Here to prove the point of how sort of elusive some of these motifs can be, we see that the vase design to the right is somehow imitating a sort of arabesque panel instead of a, a vase. So we see a vase trying to be an ornamental panel. And I just wanted to show you as a comparison, um, this sort of arabesque painting uh, panel design to the right. And you can see just how similar both are. And so from this very fantastical vase trying to be a panel ornament, I wanted to show you one of the designs in the real, in the flesh with this wonderful um, example of va two vases with cover around 1786, possibly by Michel Voisin or François Voisin, um, which is currently at the Met, which is clearly very similar to one of the plates found in the book of vases, which I've just shown you. Thank you very much for your time and for coming along with me on this whistle stop tour of some of the most popular motifs found in the ornament print collection at the Cooper Hewitt. We could have explored countless others, but we are limited by time and patience, and I appreciate the time you've given me. I just wanted to end but with this quick slide showcasing some modern and contemporary artists, including Michael Eden, Kate Malone, Magdalene Odondo, Phoebe Cummings, Alexander Mussouris, who proved that ornament is still very much alive and well, just in case you thought we might have become a little complacent living in our modernist sort of minimalist world. I hope I've helped pique your interest in this collection that you might come and visit either the website or in person to explore some of the delights found within these wonderful albums of the Cooper Hewitt. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. Um, thank you, Rachel, for that wonderful talk and the chance to learn about the Duclou collection. Uh, the prints are truly incredible and it was particularly enlightening to hear the background and historical context surrounding them, um, not just looking at these beautiful things. Uh, I want to remind everyone that if you have questions, for Rachel, now would be a great time to drop them into the Q&A. And in the meantime, I want to underscore the DeClue collection as a very special uh, and large group of works. They originally entered the Cooper Hewitt in 1921 and were purchased, as Rachel has mentioned, from Jean-Léon DeClue, who was an architectural decorator and collector in Sèvres, France. Uh, de Clou had previously owned a gilding shop and had an expertise in 18th century French interiors in ornamental painting. And in addition to his collections of works on paper, he also had decorative arts, furniture, uh, and ceramics. 
um, the, muse the museum had originally brought more than 500 ornament and architectural drawings from him in 1911. And at this time, this was considered one of the most important additions to New York collections since J.P. Morgan's gift of the Henschel collection of medieval and French uh, 18th century decorative art to the Met. 10 years later, um, Cooper Hewitt purchased this extensive set of ornamental prints. And this collection was intended to be available for students, artists, architects, artisans, and other designers for study. Uh, the issues of access and education were especially important since they entered the museum when it was still part of the Cooper Union. Uh, the creation of a teaching museum was part of the industrialist and founder uh, Peter Cooper's vision to have an institution that would supplement the education at Cooper Union. And the slide that Rachel showed in the beginning, I think really uh, highlights this. The Cooper Hewitt has had the DeClue collection for a long time, and the works have been studied by various scholars to whom we are very grateful for their contributions. However, this project to catalog, digitize, and publicly present on these works is very exciting for us. It presents an amazing new resource that is now accessible to people around the world. Uh, so far, we've cataloged and digitized over 6,000 objects, um, which are available online, but there is more as the collection consists of nearly 13,000 prints. Uh, and this project is such an important way for us to share our collections to the public, as well as to students, researchers, and artists who actively want to use the collection, but may, may not be able to travel to New York to see it in person. Um, so, Rachel, uh, this project is obviously very complex, and you've spoken about the different ways artists and publishers describe their prints. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak more about your own choices in how you describe these works and the terms you use, and, and what are the considerations you make in, in these decisions? Thank you so much, Jamie, for um, that summary and for your question. So obviously there's uh, the kind of ideal ideal answer to that and what we would love to do if time was of no uh meaning and I had sort of all of the time in the world to describe and to work on them. But clearly there's for any project, there's always restrictions um, that are also placed uh, are in place with the sort of um, the databases that we use and so on. So uh, we because the database that we are using TMS, which is used by many, many museums, uh, we don't sort of at the moment have a way of indexing specific terms, but we're possibly exploring that as well. Um, so at the moment, we we capture what we uh, describe as the core information, which is sort of maker, um, dates, place, uh, titles, um, and so on. Uh, place, I mentioned that. And then the, the, the description, uh, which can be quite difficult as you've seen some of, as we've looked at some of these <laughs> objects, I hope I've made the point that it's quite hard to, to describe in words and that's why the photography is very useful. Um, but we've, our, our hopes was to just to describe and use certain keywords that we think would be used by both uh, more uh, uh, sort of a, a wider public, but also the, so it needs to be accessible to a wider public, but also to researchers that are uh, more in tune with a specialized knowledge. So at the moment, it's it's a description that is not the sort of physical descriptions that we include are not perfect by any means, but we try and use as many kind of keywords that um, that come to mind when I think of how someone might want to search for this type of object. Obviously, cataloging is also subjective. Um, and so there's countless ways of approaching it. Um, but yes, oh, just also to mention that there's a lot more information that's been captured on the back end of the database that isn't reflected yet in the uh, on the website. So if you want more information, if you're looking through the catalog um, online and you have some more questions about those pieces, um, there is more information there um, available if you inquire directly. 
Um, it's just limitations with the, the website as well. Great, I hope that's thank helps. you. <laughs> So I have a question from a curator at two historic house museums, and she asks um, how you trace a realized design back to its source, which I think is a great question considering you showed at the very end those examples of the vases and the prints. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's sort of just, well, there's so much work that's been done. It's, 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 the sorry, what I'm trying to say is you can find links between um, real objects and the printed source in all sorts of research that's out there. Um, it's about sort of looking um, in different fields as well and not just necessarily staying within the uh, academic research of kind of print history. You've got to look into the to the other uh, worlds of furniture or ceramics or decorative arts. So there's a lot of that stuff that works that work that's already been um, identified and out there. Uh, but when it comes to you yourself, kind of finding a source, I think it's. Uh, I mean, again, if if these pieces are cataloged with terms that are helpful online for different databases, then that would help in, in terms of searching. But it's also a matter, uh, unfortunately, of just a visual memory of looking <laughs> and going through lots and lots of sources um, and hoping that you find, you find one. Um, often a lot of these prints could have been related to real objects, but some of these objects or interiors don't exist anymore either. So there's also that element. It's a bit of chance. And <laughs> as I think um, as fellow researchers, we all always are hoping for that little bit of good luck when we are looking at prints or objects and trying to make these connections. Um, but related to realized objects that are based on ornament prints or drawing from ornament prints, um, what is the means by which these ornament designs were scaled up or down uh, since they could be reproduced at the scale of architecture or jewelry? Um, it would be interesting to know how the designs were reproduced at different scales. Um, well, the printmakers would uh, copy, you'd have, if you were scaling these, sorry, the, the, the prints that we're looking at particularly uh, were um, intaglio prints produced on metal plates. So they're etched or engraved or different techniques on, on uh, metal plates. So to produce different scales, sometimes you find kind of luxury editions where the same book is produced a different um, uh, size paper and scale. So you would have to uh, copy, the printmaker would have to copy to scale a and etch a, a different plate. They couldn't sort of blow it up in a way that we we could do today. Um, uh, I hope that's answered that sort of that question. It would be m creating multiple, yeah, multiple plates. So I have another question related to the printmaker, um, and this question is asking about who controls the selection of prints that were published, um, and whether you think it is the print designers or the sellers who had more agency, and whether this is reflected in the subjects published. Mm. I think it really depends as well on who had the resources to undertake the production and printing of uh, these uh, designs. Um, yeah, so the market, I mean, publishers were uh, extremely intelligent in trying to uh, kind of repurpose designs for different fashionable, different tastes and different purposes. And we see that as well um, in the in the different title pages and descriptions that they put. So control, I mean, that, sorry, that's, it's a hard answer because it really depends on the context. It depends um, on the artists. Uh, also it depends on who owns the plates themselves, right? The plates are very expensive compared to the print, the reproductions, the, the, the impressions made from them. So who owns the plates? Uh, often the publishers own the plates and therefore they control when and how many impressions are made. And you can see this uh, especially important where, I um, mean, like all sort of 
artistic communities or makers at the time, there was, uh, guild systems and family units and networks that are working together and intermarrying and that's a way of of kind of holding on to the uh, printed material so you see sometimes plates being reproduced uh, later editions like 50 years later and that's often either that new publisher purchased those plates but also sometimes inherited them through various um, marriage links and so on so sorry i rambled a little bit but it who owns the plates is important who can own the plate um uh, and who has the means to undertake that production i guess sometimes it's the artists themselves sometimes not sometimes in collaboration i hope Great, that is clear <laughs> Um, I think just being mindful of the time, I think yes, uh, we can do one last question. And um, you've shown some really beautiful works. Uh, however, a lot of them, I think all of them are by male engravers. So one of our or male artists. Yeah. So <laughs> well, we have uh, someone asking um, if you could speak a little bit more about female engravers um, and their relation to the artists and designers such as Blondell, or if some of them were working within their own networks. Yes, so I did try and, men I mean, I didn't emphasize so many of the female names that I mentioned, but I did mention a few uh, women printmakers and also a few women publishers. Um, so um, it's a great question because I always find it fascinating, especially working on the, the uh, publishers. For me, the, the women often are silent partners. These are family units working together, and you only really often see the names of women appear once they've become widowed. So the husband uh, dies, and then they take on the business, but take on the business. They've been kind of active participants in the business before. It's just that they weren't legally able to, uh, well, mostly legally able to kind of own and function in that way. So you have the Chirou, uh, two widows within the Chirou dynasty of print publishers. And I've mentioned uh, Marguerite Caillou Chirou, who's active in the middle of the century, 1729 to 55, and Geneviève Marguerite Chirou, active a bit later. These two women were crucial and very, very big uh, proponents, uh, important figures within the Parisian print trade of that time. Um, but we often in cataloging them because it's often just widow of, you know, widow of Sheru. So it's hard to uh, name them accurately, depending on the dates and so on. So sorry, the, I'm, I'm, DV, <laughs> I'm, I'm moving away. But basically, um, often in terms of printmakers, there's a lot of women printmakers. Again, often it's like any of the men in the industry too, it's family units. They're coming from their fathers or, or siblings were also with it, working within the trade. And you see that happen. And sometimes in cases like um, Rousselet that I mentioned or others, you when they are associated with like Boiseau, for example, when they're associated with a, kind of an important father who's a printmaker, an important um, brother or something, then sometimes they their maiden name kind of keeps, gets sort of maintained and we can find it. Other times um, it gets sort of gobbled up by the, the uh, married name. Um, but they're there, they're working, they're there. They're, they're just not as, uh, we have to sort of speak their names and that's part of the cataloging process is accurately uh, identifying these women and associating them with the records. And hopefully that brings more um, attention to them. Thank you for expanding on that. Um, unfortunately, I think we are out of time today, but just a couple of things before we log off. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about 18th century ornament, I invite you to look up our past exhibition catalog, Rococo, The Continuing Curve, which has amazing examples of ornament from the from the Duclou collection and beyond, including decorative arts. Rachel mentioned it earlier. Um, Rachel also has a fascinating blog post on designs for antique stoves from the Duclou collection. 
And for more history about the Duclos collection, I invite you to check out Rachel's blog post titled A, Lib A Library of Decorative Art, the Duclos Collection Ornament Prints. Uh, and both of these blog posts can be found on the Cooper Hewitt website. And I believe a post Zoom email will be sent out with these links. As I mentioned, our department is home to a huge collection of fascinating objects, so I encourage you to stay in touch through social media, uh, visit our website to see what events are going on, and if you are in New York, to visit the Cooper Hewitt and to visit our study center. And I also believe uh, instructions on how to make an appointment will be sent after the Zoom. Uh, Rachel, thank you again for this wonderful talk, as well as this discussion. Um, I thought really great questions. Uh, thank you to our wonderful team at Cooper Hewitt to help, uh, who helped us make this webinar happen today. And I want to also thank everyone for attending this Zoom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie.